All right. For those of you who may be watching with us, we welcome you into our Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening Bible study as we continue our study through the book of Acts. And we're glad to have this great group of folks here in our sanctuary and glad to have you joining us. So as we get started together, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you. And Father, uh, we thank you for this morning. Uh, thank you for your word, for Jesus, Lord, who is the embodiment of your word, who is the completion of your word. And Father, who is the promiser of our faith. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, that you have seen fit to send him to the cross and that he went willingly to die for our sins that we might be able to be saved and you be glorified because of it. Father God, we thank you for the story of Acts. We thank you for how we can look back and see how you started this church that we understand today. Lord God, we thank you that that church, this church locally, but this church also universally is built upon the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. And Lord God, we thank you that you call us into your service to worship you, to praise you, to share you, and Father, to, pray, to lift you up in all things that we do. Help us to do that very thing in all that we endeavor to do, Father, for you. Let us make sure that we're doing it with all of our hearts and that it's truly and increasingly for you. Lord God, thank you for this time. Speak to us now, Lord. Remind us as you reminded those uh, in the book of Acts what you have done for your people and who Jesus is in all of it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, we uh, have started into the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, and uh, we started into that a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, and we're going to carry out the next step or the next leg of that journey in Acts chapter 13 this evening. So uh, where we left off in Acts chapter 13, verse 12, um, Saul and his companions, his team have sailed to this island of Cyprus. They've made their way across that island from one city to the other, from the east to the west, and uh, they are looking to see where the Holy Spirit will lead them next. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm at that point in your cold where all you want to do is choke and cough. So I promise it's not COVID. I tested negative for that, So, uh, but we do still have this cold that's working on us, so forgive me if I do cough a little bit. Um, so they end up at a place called Paphos, uh, which was notoriously a rough and very pagan city there on the island of, Cy of Cyprus. And there we read uh, in verse 13 of chapter 13 of the book of Acts what happens next. It says, From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them and re to return to Jerusalem. From Perga they went on to Pisidian Antioch, on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. <coughs> Excuse me. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. And for about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. And he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel, the prophet. And then the people asked for a king. And he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you are looking for. But there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. And fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. 
And for many days he was sent by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. And they are now his witnesses to our people. <coughs> Excuse me. We get a, a retelling. We get a telling of the history of the Jews from a Jew to other Jews and God-fearing Gentiles, people who were not Jewish but did want to worship God and therefore worshiped alongside of the Jews, who had not yet put their faith in Jesus. We get a telling of what God has done through his people and a link to what God has done in the person of Jesus. And so therefore, this is a sharing by Paul of the gospel. This is a sharing and a recounting uh, of, of all that has happened. Now, does he tell every detail for all those hundreds and hundreds of years? Well, no, he hits the high points, uh, but, but he's in a setting where he can share the gospel with people who've not heard the gospel. And he does so in a way that fit the setting, that would be approachable by and for the people, uh, and in a way that made sense, and in a way that was true, by the way. So as we see here, as we go verse by verse, we see that uh, they, they sail to the next place. At that place, as happens in, in Paul's missionary journeys, we see that uh, some leave and some come, and some go and some, some stay. As, so the team somewhat changes from time to time. Here we see it says in verse 13 that from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, and there John left them to return to Jerusalem. So a couple of things here. One, we see that there's a lot more going on than just Paul's missionary journeys, right? God is not just using the missionary journeys of one particular apostle to, uh, to, to build the kingdom. He's putting that together with church work that was continuing to go on in Jerusalem and all the places that there were churches already. Uh, he's continuing to share the gospel and spread the gospel in other directions. We just happen to get the recorded account of Paul's missionary journeys so that we can see the direction that it spread um, and then that makes sense because it's through this direction that, that the gospel spread that we eventually get the gospel uh, and so that that is very fitting to us in verse 14 it says from Perga they went on to Pisidian and Antioch and this is how the missionary journeys went uh, they went from one place to the other now when we take short-term mission trips usually we go to one place one city one village one town uh one church or one you know ministry and we work there for a specific amount of time maybe it's a day maybe it's a week maybe it's longer than that uh, but we do that and then we come back the missionary journeys were, were much longer first of all they were not just a week at a time uh, it took a lot longer to get from place to place and the work that they did took longer in each place um, and so we don't get every detail of every step of the journey, but we understand that the Spirit will continue to move Paul and his team from wherever he had taken them to wherever he was going to take them. <coughs> Sometimes, as we'll see later on in the book of Acts, they, they disagreed on where the Spirit was leading them. And so they would part company, and maybe they'd come back together later, and maybe they wouldn't. Uh, but, but God was working. And, and I, I point that out to say this. That whatever God is doing in my life, in your life, in our life here at Harrisville Baptist Church, uh, whatever he's doing right here, we don't ever need to be blinded to the fact that we are simply a part of everything he's doing. And what he is doing here is powerful and is amazing. But when you think that it's just simply a sliver, simply a fraction, a very small fraction of what he's doing throughout the world... That shows us even how much greater our God is than we usually give him credit for. We are, we are but a cell, if you want to put it that way, in the, in the organism, in the body of Christ. And yet he calls us all to work together. And each cell is important. Each church, each local body is important as we make up the universal body of Christ. And so we see that played out here. In some places we are more familiar, in other places we're less familiar, or maybe even ignorant of it. We don't even know what all else was going on, but we know that it was going on. Uh, it says there that, that they went to Pisidian in Antioch, and on the Sabbath they entered the synagogue and sat down. Well, what do you want to do, or where do you want to go when you, what you want to do is talk to people about God? Well, uh, a church is a pretty good place to start. <coughs> now... This didn't always go well, and we'll read more about that as we go. Um, can you imagine someone who uh, was, was preaching a new 
version of Christianity today coming in and sitting down in this pew where nobody else will sit right here and saying, I'd like to share something and then sharing something that we've never heard of before. Uh, that'd be kind of interesting, right? Um, and so it was absolutely dependent upon the Holy Spirit to soften the heart of these Jewish people who were worshiping in the synagogue. Uh, now, part of the worship there would have been uh, these services that were, were very much, um, you know, teaching in orientation. They were very much, uh, you know, reading of scripture and, and, a, and a discussion about it and things that would go on. So there was a lot of, uh, not debate, but there was a lot of, of dialogue that went on in the synagogues. Well, of course, God used that as a great venue for just what we just read right here. For Paul and others like Paul to go into the synagogues where people already knew of the God of the Bible, God of Jesus, the God of creation, the God of the Jews, God the Father as they knew him. And then to complete that knowledge by talking to them, introducing them to Jesus the Son, and then in the power of the Holy Spirit to see people be saved. And that's, that's God working that all together. That's exactly what happened here. They went into the synagogue. They participated in what was going on. They didn't bust down the door and say, oh, you people don't get it yet. You don't know it. You know, all this stuff. They didn't, they don't, they didn't do that at all. They went in orderly. They went in with the purpose. They, they were absolutely there to have an opportunity and to have this opportunity many, many places over the course of the ministry that they're in. Uh, but they didn't disrupt what we see next. It says, after the reading of the law from the law and the prophets, which would have been a customary part of the service there, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. <coughs> so, what, what are they asking for? Well, they're asking for a word of, uh, from God. They're asking these traveling, and Paul, of course, is a Jewish man. He's, a, he's educated, he's, he's recognized, and and, uh, and they ask him, hey, do you have anything to add? Do you have anything from the Lord to offer to our people? Um, uh, it's somewhat akin to if we had somebody who we knew was a, uh, you know, a particularly accomplished musician uh, to step into our service and Steele might want to look at him and say, hey, would you want to come up and sing uh, a worship song or, or a praise song or do something like that? Or if I had a preacher that I knew that came in and we saw him sitting back in the back of the, you know, in the back of the sanctuary, because that's where preachers sit when we go to somebody else's church, right? We never get to sit there in our own church. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, hey, brother so-and-so, would you like to come up here and, and just, uh, you know, what, what's God got on your heart? So that's exactly what happened. Well, what's on Paul's heart? Well, the gospel. That's what he's out doing. He is out going, you know, following the Spirit from place to place, sharing the truth about who Jesus is. Verse 16, it says, standing up, so he... He, he accepts the invitation to speak, and he stands up so he can be heard. It says, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. He's addressing everybody in the room. That would have covered everyone who would have been in his hearing or in the sound of his voice at that point was either Jewish people themselves that were by birth and by practice Jewish uh, or Gentiles who had come into that line of belief who had come into that system of worship who had believed in the one true god and so he's speaking to them now remember he's not speaking to a bunch of seekers right he's speaking to people who are sure of what they're there for right he's not searching you know, he's not talking to people who came in there searching going yeah i just don't know what i think about god they knew what they thought about god they knew what they believed in about god and so for him to be able to tell them anything more or different than what they'd already heard um, would, you know, without the work of the Holy Spirit would have been, you know, it would have gone over like a lead balloon. Uh, it would have, he would have been run on around. Sometimes he is for all kinds of different reasons. But here it says, he says, listen to me. And in verse 17, it says, the God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. Speaking of the patriarchs, uh, the Jews that have come before us in our lineage. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. Every Jewish person, everyone in that synagogue would have been perfectly aware that the Jews spent a long period of time as slaves in Egypt. That was part of the practice. That was part of what they read from. That was part of what they taught and what they discussed. He says, with mighty power, he led them out of that country. So immediately, first he's talked about being a fellow Israelite. He's, he's identified himself as also being an Israelite himself. And he is connected with his audience in a place where 
he knows they can comprehend. He said to them something that they would they could relate to. Um, it's you know if you go into um, speak to a group of teenagers, you know, and, and maybe you mentioned something about social media or something like that. Now be careful how you do that because just what you think catches them right where they are was like 10 years ago for them. Uh, you'd probably be behind. I know I am most of the time. Uh, there was a time when I was on top of it, but that time is long past. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, if you go in to talk to, uh, you know, a, a bunch of guys at a wild game supper, what do you talk to them about? You don't go in and talk to them about knitting, do you? You go in and talk to them about hunting or fishing or, you know, about outdoor stuff. If you go to talk to the booster club, you talk to them about sports. You know, he, he identifies with this crowd. He knows the room he's in and, and the spirit prompts him and he's obedient to the spirit to address them in a way that they can relate to. Uh, which, by the way, is... It, it, whether we get a chance to speak in front of large numbers of people about Christ or simply just talk in regular conversation about who Christ is, this is still the right way to go. That we would follow the Holy Spirit and not just come in and say, well, you know, we need to talk about your sin. <laughs> no, that's not the best way to lead off, right? You could, and the Spirit might prompt you to do that. And there might be occasions where that is not only uh, appropriate but necessary. But I'm going to tell you, after a lot of time of getting to share the gospel with a lot of people over the years, very few times has that been the appropriate and necessary way to go uh, to start off with, right? Probably doesn't go over real well down at the store on, in a, on a weekday morning, right? Probably doesn't go over well at the beauty parlor. You know, probably doesn't go, you know, go over well in the checkout line at, the, at, at Kroger or wherever you might do your grocery shopping. Um, no, you start with the basics. You start with the connection. And that's what he does here. He says in, uh, in verse 18, it says, For about 40 years... He endured their conduct in the wilderness. These people also would have been familiar with the true story that was how their ancestors acted in the wilderness and what all that prevented one generation of their ancestors from being able to experience. Verse 19, he goes on, continues the rest of the story. He says, and he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. Talking about the promised land, the nation that was inhabited by the people, the Canaanites, and the many people that made up that group and uh, all the, <clears throat> the seven nations of those people that God put down before his people so that his people could inherit the land that he had called them to and promised them. He said all this took about 450 years. Now in my Bible, that takes about that much room, right? 450 years of history uh, in, the, in about that much, you know. Now, a lot of possibilities here. Could he have said it exactly that way? Absolutely. Um, could he have said more? And this is what the Spirit is, is, you know, is, is inspiring Luke to write down so that we can get on with the whole point. Yeah, that's possible too, right? Um, it, it speaks, though, to he's making a connection. He's taking people from where they are to where Jesus is so that they can meet him where they are at the moment. He can meet them where they are at the moment and making that connection says in the second part of verse 20, it says, After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Well, he just took care of all the years of the book of Judges. Right? That's a lot of years right there. Uh, so he is moving quick and fast through the history of the Jews. He says, Then the people asked for a king, and, they, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. That's exactly what happened. When we read through the Old Testament, we understand that that's what happened. Saul, Samuel, uh, the prophet, was, uh, was, was called to find that king. And then somewhat quickly, uh, in the scheme of time, he was called to call the next one. Because the one that was called rebelled against God and did his own thing instead of following what God said. And God took his hand off of him. It says, after removing Saul, in verse, uh, verse uh, 22, it says, after removing Saul, he made David their king. And God testified concerning David, I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. This was the endorsement that God gave, the, or, the ordination that God gave for David to be the king. Verse 23 says, from this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. All right, so now, up until verse 22, the end of verse 22, um, Paul has not said anything that they would have had any objection to. He's not given them any new information. But he has traced an understandable and digestible line of thinking 
to get to this point that he starts in verse 23. He brings up David. Well, we know that from the line of David comes Jesus, and we can trace that lineage back in Scripture. We know that that's the case, and that, was, that is the case because that was exactly how it was prophesied by God's prophets to be. That is exactly how God planned it to be. And so he's saying, look, you know that as Jewish people, we are waiting for this Savior, this Messiah that will be from the, from the line of David. And here in verse 23, he says, that person is the Savior of Israel, Jesus. And in verse 24, it says, before the coming of Jesus. So he says, hey, about to tell you about Jesus, but let me backtrack to something a little bit more recent. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. Now, whether the people at Pisidian and Antioch or, uh, you know, had heard of John the Baptist or not, he is including this. Why does he include, why does the Spirit call Paul to include uh, the mention of John the Baptist? Because everything he said at this point is leading to, pointing to the importance and the identification of Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah, as the Savior, so that they can then have an opportunity to put their faith in him and believe themselves. <coughs> so he mentions John, uh, and, and as he's talking about, about him, he says this. He says, um, as John was completing his work, in verse 25, he said, who do you suppose I am? I'm not the one you're looking for. Because people came to John the Baptist, and who did they think he was? They thought he was the Messiah. He preached a bold message. He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, you need to get right before you get left, is what he was saying to him. He's preaching boldly, and it was a new way of teaching. Not quite as impressive as what Jesus would do after, but going in that direction. And so he says that, and when he asked the people, when they'd come think he was the Messiah and start to hail him as the Savior, he said, no, 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 no. I'm not the one you're looking for. He says, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. In other words, say, hey, you think this is great. The one that's really been promised, I'm just part of the deal. The one that's really been promised is far, far greater than me. I'm not even able to take his shoes off. I'm not even, I'm, I'm so low, I can't compare to him, I can't even do that. In verse 26, it says, fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, readdressing that he's talking to everybody in, the, in that room. It is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. Remember how he was invited to begin to speak. You have a message of exhortation to share with us. This is his message of exhortation. Well, what does it mean to exhort? Uh, to, you know, exhortation means that I'm going to tell you something to prompt you to action. And I'm going to tell you in such a way that's going to encourage you to take that action. And when it's exhortation that's a, of the biblical sense or, or inspired by the Holy Spirit, it's not just me as a speaker telling you what I want you to do and trying to get you to do it. Uh, that is a form of exhortation. But biblical exhortation is telling you the truth of God and then letting, you know, praying that the Spirit, trusting that the Spirit will move in your heart to move you to action on his own. And so this is the word of exhortation. He says, look, I've said all that to say this. We've been given that message of salvation. In verse 27, it says, The people of Jerusalem and their rulers didn't recognize Jesus. And he throws in there, he says, Yet in condemning him, uh, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the word of the prophets, uh, the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. So he's basically saying, Look, the people of Jerusalem didn't get it. They didn't see that Jesus was the one they were looking for and waiting for. They didn't see it. And yet, even in their thinking they'd do away with him, they fulfilled the will of God. They played the part that they were called or, uh, or uh, made to play, if you want to look at it that way. He said, look, they, they, they did this. And you hear about these things, these prophecies, every time you get together in this place. Verse 28 says, though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. They couldn't, even, uh, they couldn't even prove there was a reason to have him killed. And so they just said, hey, can we just kill him? Can you just take care of him? And they played upon Pilate's insecurities <coughs> and political aspirations and desires to make that happen. And then he continues to share the truth of, of the crucifixion and resurrection. Verse 29, he says, when they carried out all that was written about him, including the arrest, including the 
beating and the interrogation and the accusations and the torture and then the crucifixion when they all of that had been prophesied as well when they finished out when they carried out all that was written about him they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb but verse 30 but god raised him from the dead another one of those but god moments that uh, where things are going one way but god does something different God was the one working this together. He's relating this to these people. But God raised him from the dead. And then in verse 31, the final one for our passage this evening, he says, And for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. He was seen by those who had been with him. He says, They are now his witnesses to our people. Now, he's going to go on to finish out the point of what he's saying. We'll get to that, Lord willing, next Sunday evening. But what we see here is a lot of things. One, Paul's got a part to play in bringing this message to these people. And he does so obediently and patiently, eloquently, because he's speaking the very word of God. We also see that throughout the history of God's people, he's had a plan, and it all ties together. None of it has been an offshoot or a one-off or a thing that was just a wild hair. And he said, oh, let's not go back to that again. Let's go something, do something different. No, God's been working his plan all the way through. Another thing we see in that passage is, is that, hey, the people don't always understand God's plan. They think they do, uh, much like the people he was speaking to at the moment, and much like many people who have read this passage since, think we've got it all together, think we understand who God is, but God still has more to teach us maybe about who he is and who jesus is and who we are or are not yet in christ ourselves uh, but maybe about how we can continue to serve maybe about being called to uh to to share the gospel in all kinds of different ways both where we live or somewhere else or both um, we see all of that going on um, and the thing that we see that overrides all of that is is that god is spreading the word about him to this new place to this synagogue full of people who want to worship God but don't know fully about him yet. There are people in this world who have seen a, 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 a sliver of who God is, who have seen a part of who God is, and they want to do right by him, but they don't yet know how to do that because they don't understand. They've not been taught who Jesus is. And folks, that's where we come in. That's where we get to step in. Are we going to be Paul? Nope. That's not the point. But do we get to be like Paul and that God could use us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone who would give their life to him if but someone would share with them? That's why we read elsewhere in scripture that they can't hear unless somebody preaches and nobody can preach if they don't go and nobody can go if they're not sent. We get to take part in all of that. And at the end of the day, that's what we come to this church or any other Christian church to do, isn't it? Should be. Biblically, that's what we are coming to do, is to be better equipped, better encouraged, and maybe be able to be made more willing and even comfortable in sharing the gospel with people that we meet. It's not just simply about bringing others here that they could hear the gospel. That's great, and we love that. But it's about taking the gospel that, if we've put our faith in Jesus, resides in us taking that out and being able to articulate our faith in such a way that they can hear it and understand it as we follow the Holy Spirit in sharing with them. For a lot of us, especially if we've been in church a long time, sometimes we might think that our going days are over. And maybe our going days out, outside of the county or outside of the state may be over. We may not step foot on another country's soil anytime you know, between now and heaven. We may not go uh, across the country again. Uh, yeah, that's possible. I mean, certainly at some point we all stop doing that. Um, but that doesn't mean that we stop taking the gospel. That doesn't mean that we stop serving with the love of Jesus. And then when people have, uh, have the opportunity to give us the chance to tell them why we do that, we share it. That's why we learn the gospel. That's why we learn scripture so that we can then in turn share it with others. I hope and pray this weekend that, that whatever God has laid out for you this week, that your main goal will be to share the gospel in it. So whether you're going to work, whether you're going to the house, whether you're going to the store or the doctor, or whether you're going to go on vacation or whether you're going to try not to see anybody at all, I hope that in all of that, 
there will be ways for you to share the gospel. And I believe with all my heart that there are and there will be. I hope that for each of us in those opportunities we have to share, that we'll take that opportunity to glorify God and make useful the salvation that he has given us to be made useful in his kingdom and for his glory. Let's go to Lord in prayer as we wrap up. Lord God, we thank you for this evening. Father, we thank you for these men and women that are here, those that are watching at home. Father God, we pray, Lord, that you would give us, first off, Father, the, the humility, the calling that comes from you to put our faith in Jesus Christ, and that through that we would experience your salvation that only comes through you, and, and Father, through the sacrifice that you made on the cross in Jesus' death, and then the power shown in his resurrection. Father God, help us, Lord, to first give our life to you, and then when we do, to truly live our life for you, not just having you as part of our life, but letting you be our life. And Father, dictate to us what that looks like for each one of us, and let us go willingly, sharing your gospel wherever you take us. Father, when you take us from this place, let us go encouraged, motivated, equipped, and ready to share in whatever way you'll allow us, all to your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.